We are live. Great. Good morning. I'd like to formally welcome everyone to the February 24th, 2021 MAPC Executive Committee meeting. Uh, my name is Erin Wortman. I am the president of MAPC. And a little housekeeping before we start. The Executive Committee is being conducted remotely via Zoom video conference consistent with Governor Baker's Executive Order of March 12th, 2020. To provide public access to the meeting while limiting the potential for abuse of video conferencing technology, members of the public may view the proceeding at www.youtube.com backslash user backslash MAPC Metro Boston. Um, I also want to remind everyone that we are live on YouTube. Hello, all the people at home watching either live or in syndication. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And with that, um, I am going to take the roll. Um, so here we go. If everyone could unmute. Sharonda? John Barrows? Past President Keith Bergman? Present. Karen Canfield? Here. Adam Chapdelaine? Present. <laughs> Bob Cohen? Here. Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? Here. John DePriest? Here. Yolanda Greaves? Here. Sandra Hackman? Here. Mo Handel? Here. Jared Johnson? Tabor Keeley? Here. Steve Olinoff? Here. Caitlin Pasafaro, I believe, is going to be late. Uh, George Proakis? Courtney Rainey? Present. Uh, Jenny Wright? Here. Vanda Narao? Sam Seidel? Here. Steve Silvera is going to be late. Lauren Shortlush? Here. <laughs> you got it. it. Okay. Did. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, Mayor Spicer? Juan Vega? Present. Elaine Vanya? Elaine, um, Aaron Wortman, that's my name, here. Um, I see Vandana Rao joined us. Yes, here. Good morning. Okay, good afternoon. Oh, good morning. Hello. <laughs> Almost there. Um, great. Did I miss anyone or did anyone come after? Oh, Sharonda is here as well. Thank you. Did I miss anyone else uh, when I was calling the role that may have a beginning of alphabet name? Great. Thank you so much again. Um, so before we head into um, the first item or the next item on the agenda, I'm just going to pass it to Executive Di uh, Director Mark um, for just a quick um, kind of message. Aaron, thank you very much. Um, as many members of the board know, and for those who didn't, I have just forwarded some information. Um, we lost one of our dear friends and colleagues last Monday. Uh, Carl Quackenbush, who is the former executive director of the Central Transportation Planning Staff, CTPS, which as most of you know, is part of this organization, uh, died very suddenly at his home in Warwick, Mass, uh, at the age of 66, um, only a year and a half or so after retiring, uh, after 35 years of service at CTPS. Um, it was a great shock to many of us, I know, to the MPO board members and past MPO board members who are on this committee. Uh, it was a, a loss of a dear friend. Um, Carl was hands down one of the finest, sweetest, gentlest public servants I have ever had the pleasure to work with. He never seemed to have an unkind word for anybody. He worked through uh, difficult issues, um, with a sense of commitment and uh, a search, searching for a solution all the time. Uh, he did not have an easy job. CTPS is, is situated in a slightly bit of an odd situation between the MPO and MAPC and MassDOT. And it can be a close and challenging space from time to time. And he always uh, approached it with a plum and with great professionalism. Uh, he truly believed 
that transportation planning and planning more broadly could be a force for good in our society. And I think he executed on that commitment every day of his career. Um, he had, as I think some of you know, decided after retirement to fulfill the lifelong ambition of being a farmer. And he and his wife purchased a farm in Franklin County and he immediately became actively engaged in Franklin County and in fact was a member of the planning board in his town. Uh, I cannot tell you how much I'm gonna miss him and how shocked I, I was and really still am by the suddenness of his loss. And I wanted to um, just make sure to mention that to you and to observe a moment of silence uh, on Carl's behalf, if we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thanks, Mark. Um, Carl will definitely be missed uh, by many. Um, he touched a lot of lives, policies, people and places, so thanks. Um, next on the agenda is uh, the approval of minutes from January 27th, 2021. Motion to accept. Second. Um, <laughs> motion made by Bob Cohen, second made by Mo. Any questions, comments before we do the vote? Great. Um, roll call votes required. Um, so if everyone could just unmute for a second and we'll get it going. Sharonda Almeida. Aye. John Barrows. Keith Bergman. Aye. Karen Cantfield. Aye. Adam Chapdelaine. Aye. Bob Cohen. Yes. Mayor Cartatone. Tom Daniel. Aye. John DePriest. Aye. Yolanda Greaves. Aye. Sandra Hackman. Aye. Mo Handel. Aye. Jerry Johnson. Abstain. Uh, Tabor Keeley. Aye. Uh, Steve Olinoff. Aye. Caitlin Passafaro. Uh, George Proakis. Courtney Rainey. Aye. Jenny Wright. Aye. Vandana Rao. Aye. Sam Seidel. Yes. Steve Silvera. Lauren Shirtliff. Yes. Uh, Mayor Spicer. Juan Vega. Aye. Elaine Vanya. Aaron Wartman. Aye. Uh, motion passes with some abstentions. Thank you all for that. Next up on the agenda is the report of the treasurer, Sam. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And uh, greetings to everybody. I hope everybody's enjoying this sunny day. Um, so we've got a couple of things on the agenda for the treasurer, actually three things. Uh, one is the December 2020 income statement, which we'll do first. Then we'll look at the mid-year uh, budget adjustment. And then we'll look at the uh, FY22 assessment. So why don't we... Those are the three items we'll look at. Why don't we start with the uh, December 2020 income statement? Um, you should have all this uh, in the in the email packet that you received. Um, no uh, real news to report here. Um, our direct labor was right on budget, pretty much, as were our administrative expenses. We like both of those, and that uh, leads us to a our overhead rate for the month of 100. Uh, and 23%, which leaves us at a cumulative uh, for the year overhead rate of 122%. That's all excellent because our approved rate is 123%. So getting right to that is exactly what we want. The only uh, thing to note here is that our revenue, um, our total revenue was uh, higher than expected. And that actually will lead into the mid-year budget discussion because uh, revenues have been good. Uh, but that's really only a note for the December one. We'll talk more about revenues in a, in a second. Um, unless there are questions, I would entertain a motion uh, to accept the uh, December 2020. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? I see question. Bob has a question. Dan? Yeah. Uh, one question. So um, that's great that we're still under our overhead rate. 
Um, in the past year, with all the additional equipment and licenses that we had to buy to outfit people to work from home remotely, um, are those costs going into our overhead or are those like, like a one-time sunk cost? How are, we, how are we accounting for those? Well, we're actually going to see that in our mid-year review of the expenditures, because as you can imagine, with people not in the office, that's a decrease. But things like licensing for uh, online services or you know, PDFs, Adobe's, et cetera, uh, that's an increase in cost. Um, that is, uh, so that will show up in our, in our mid-year expenditure. I don't know if I've answered that sufficiently for you right now, uh, but what I'd say is let's pause that and we can, we can bring that up in about five minutes time, if that's all right. All right, thank you, Sam. Sure. Uh, seeing no further, Aaron, can I hand it back to you for a roll call on? Yeah, on sure. And just to clarify, who made that motion? I know Tabor, you were one of the two. Uh, I Thanks made the motion. Robert, right? Okay, Mo Tabor made the motion. And who did the second? Mo Handel. Okay, Mo. Sorry. Thank you. All the voices were in the middle of my screen, so I couldn't. I couldn't tell. Okay. So with the motion made by Tabor and the second made by Mo. And seeing no other uh, uh, questions or discussion, I'm going to do roll call vote, which is required. So everyone on mute, please. Tiranda Almeida? Aye. Uh, John Barrows? Keith Bergman? Aye. Karen Canfield? Aye. Adam Chapdelaine? Aye. Bob Cohen? Yes. Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda Greaves? Aye. Sandra Hackman? Aye. Mo Handel? Aye. Jerry Johnson? Aye. Tabor Keeley? Aye. Steve Olinoff? Aye. Caitlin Passafaro? Yes. Per oh, hi, Caitlin. Sorry. Hi, I'm um, here. <laughs> George Proakis? Aye. Courtney Rainey? Aye. Jenny Raitt? Aye. Uh, Vanda Narao? Aye. Sam Seidel? Aye. Steve Silvera, Lauren Shirtliff, aye. Mayor Spicer, Juan Vega, aye. Uh, Elaine Vanya, Aaron Wartman, aye. Motion passes. Thank you all. Uh, Sam, next. All item. right. So thank thank you on that. Um, and now we're going to look at the mid year uh, budget review. Uh, you have all that paperwork in your packet as well, and. Um, let me start by always just by thanking Sheila for all the time she spends with me to get me up to speed on all this. Um, so many thanks to her and to Rebecca and Mark, of course. Uh, so first, we're going to look at the revenue budget. And um, let me uh, just start by saying that just to remind everybody, this mid-year review is uh, what Sheila often refers to as a truing up of the numbers. So we, we do the initial budget pro process in April. Uh, we go ab about halfway through the year, and then we relook at those numbers to see what's actually happened in that first half of the year. And then we correct the numbers. So as Sheila often uh, describes it, which I, I love this description, so that we can land the plane uh, safely in June, on June 30th. Uh, that's the process we're doing today. Um, the overall picture for this mid-year moment is that the budget numbers are uh, very good, in fact. Um, as you remember, as we do every year with MAPC, the, the budget process is very conservative. It's always the way that uh, Mark and Rebecca approach this. Uh, let's be safe and conservative. With COVID, that was especially true. So the projections in April were very cautious. And as it turns out, there's been a huge amount of new revenue that was not in the original budget. So that's the overall picture. Um, I, I should add that with all of that revenue, and you'll see this as, as we go through the numbers, a lot will is being deferred to next year for FY22. That's a very good thing in a way because it sets us up well for FY22, which was always a concern of ours when COVID sort of kicked off, not just what it would do to this year's budget, but what it would do to next year's budget. Um, so that's very good. Um, 
of course, when you got a lot of revenue coming in, you have to hire for that, and MAPC is in the process of that. So let's just let's dig into the uh, to the revenue budget uh, to start. That's um, the sheet with a lot of uh, little lines on it. I like to use the technical terminology here. Uh, so it's the sheet with a lot of numbers and lines and projects on it. That's a that's the revenue budget. And we're going to start. We're actually going to skip over collective procurement for a second. We're just going to look at a couple of details, so you get a, a sense or a feel of what's going on in here. On that first page, on page one, is local technical assistance. Um, that has come in in numbers and projects uh, much higher than many more than what was budgeted. Uh, there was a question as to whether this work would actually continue during COVID. Would people reach out to MAPC for that work? The answer has been overwhelmingly yes. And just to give you a flavor of the different kinds of projects, uh, there's a Peabody 40R project for $5,000 in that list. And then there's a, a Winchester Main Street corridor study for $30,000. But you can see that in that second column of numbers going down, that's an increase or a decrease. And there are just many, many projects that have no brackets around them. Those are all increased money. That's money we did not expect to have, we did not budget for, but now it's gonna show up uh, in, in this rev revised budget. If we go down a little further in that local technical assistance, I just wanna point out the community engagement team. Um, because everything has gone online and everybody had to figure out how to do things virtually, the community engagement team has become a much more important part of this whole process. And they've actually been able to go out and get some of their own projects going. And that's been a good thing, uh, partly for the information and the help they're providing, but also internally, just the fact that they can sort of stand alone in their own capacity in this. Um, Rebecca or Mark can, can correct me as we go to the next page, uh, just to, again, to give you a feel for this, in the EOEEA Smart Oath Grants, I, I believe, uh, I heard this correctly, that everything we applied for under that category, we actually received. So any grant funding or project we applied for, we received. It's just another indication of people's view of MAPC, their capacity to do the work and uh, the desire to partner with them. Um, of course, with more work uh, becomes more challenges, but, uh, but that's a, a good problem to have. And then if we go to the the next page, we'll just keep scrolling down to public health. And as you can imagine, under public health, there's been a huge amount of additional work with COVID, uh, just both at the community level, but also if you look uh, five or six lines down under community health is a, is a COVID-19 emergency funding for Region 3 to the tune of uh, over half a million dollars. That was money that was not in the budget back in April, but showed up during the course of the year. A lot of that money is passed through money. That's money that's going to come in the door and then go out the door. But there's a certain residual amount that will stay in MAPC for administrative costs and help. All of that's going to show up in the budget as a positive thing. Um, it just uh, the bigger the bigger point here is that there were many many questions back in April about what the revenue picture would be. Uh, it turns out people are doing this work on the one hand, and probably more importantly. Uh, people turn to MAPC for help and support as they continue their planning work, as they deal with their COVID uh, relief issues, uh, and as we get into uh, coming out of the COVID phase and uh, vaccination. Um, I will just make a couple of what I call cautionary notes, or just sort of things uh, that we're keeping our eye on. And I'll say that... Um, us on the finance committee, and I, I, I should say that the finance committee met on the, I believe it was the 18th of February to review this. So this is uh, the report of the finance committee. And I want to thank the finance committee members for that, uh, Tabor and Yolanda for that. Um, just a couple of, of cautionary notes, maybe too much. We're keeping our eyes on these. Collective procurement was what we budgeted. It just was a little bit less than prior years. And so is, is there anything in that? We, do, we don't know, but we'll, we're keeping our eye on that. Um, also just to note uh, in the revenue numbers is Metro Common, which is actually scheduled to finish up uh, in the middle of this year. If there's money uh, left over, can we find another use for that in a Metro Common related way? 
that's a question of still an unknown, but we're sort of, we're keeping our eye on that. And then a question that I have maybe more than the committee had was, you know, if the federal government makes a lot of money available uh, for states and cities and towns, uh, that can be a good thing, but it will also present challenges in that there uh, will be more work to do. So with that, that's the revenue budget. We'll look at the expense budget in a second, but why don't I pause here and see if there are any questions. And I will entertain any questions or thoughts or comments. Hearing none, let's go, let's go on uh, to the expense budget now, which is uh, the sheet that I have that has indirect costs at the top of listed at the top of it. This is these are the expenses uh, for the agency, and uh, you'll see that if you go down. Uh, to the bottom line of that sheet. It's a single page on the uh, expense budget. Uh, the numbers are basically the same. Uh, the, expenses, the expenses changed in their categories as to what we were going to spend money on, but the, as they say, the bottom line really didn't change at all. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I, I would note that uh, in the expense budget that uh, Travel, for example, has basically been zeroed out. There, there is no travel happening. There are some expenses left in the travel category um, uh, under in there, I think an in-state travel to cover things like travel into the office or parking expenses for people who have to go physically to a place, but all out of state travel and uh, was uh, reduced to zero and uh, transit passes were reduced significantly. Uh, um, uh, pardon me, Sam, just one second. I wonder if we could um, <clears throat> take the revenue budget off the screen and maybe replace it with the expense document. I don't know exactly who's doing that. Oh, thank okay. you. Thank we're you. halfway there. Okay, good. Th thank you, Mark. Sorry. I appreciate that. Uh, so we, we, I'll just pause a second while we, while we do that. Um, but we will get, we will get get through the expense side, and then we'll do the wrap up, which which are the overall numbers, which are very very positive. Um, this there looks, it is. This Thank looks like you, the, Sasha. the summary document. Um, that's the summary document. But why don't I, if it's all right, I'll I'll continue on through the expense side of it. Um, that has indirect costs up at the very top. And then once, once that's up on the screen, we, if there are any questions on that. Um, so, so travel is, uh, is down significantly, as you might imagine. Um, rent is still rent, and it's been modified slightly to include uh, escalations, which were not included in the rent number, but are now. That's uh, more of an accounting thing than anything else. Uh, uh, Sheila just says it's easier to manage all of those numbers as a single category. And so she's done that. Uh, Robert, to your point, telecommunications um, is up significantly. Uh, that includes all the web services and everything else. Um, that's uh, under operational services and it's up by $75,000 as an expense. Um, uh, Likewise, information technology is up by $10,000, whereas advertising and postage, which would often be associated with a physical meeting, actually getting the word out with pieces of paper to people, is down by $22,000. So it's, as we said, the bottom line of all this is that it nets out roughly almost exactly the same, but the, the expenditures have changed uh, given the fact that we're in this virtual world. Um, likewise, IT consulting is up uh, by $40,000. It wasn't even actually as an expenditure in the beginning of the year, but it's now obviously um, on the books is something that uh, is absolutely required. And then to note uh, the most important part of our expenditures, the calendar has been reduced because we no longer do a paper calendar. We now do everything online. Um, that is the expenditure budget, and I'll slow down for a second in case there are questions or comments on that. Sam, I have a question. Yeah. Thank, thank you for answering that um, when I asked it earlier, so that makes sense to me. 
So all the different licenses that MAPC bought or the tools we bought for our staff to work remotely, are these one-time licenses? Are they annual licenses? So uh, you can ask that question, if they are permanent, then people can stay working remotely or are they annual that when COVID is done or hopefully done soon, people will come back? Do we have any sense on that? Uh, that's a good question. To get a definitive answer, to have to ask the staff, either Rebecca, Mark, Let me, let me answer. Can... I, I think this is, you know, Robert, what you're pointing out is I think a challenge that we will have to look at for FY22, which is that, uh, you know, as I imagine, we will be in, a, in some sort of hybrid world for a long time. We will both have those, they were one-time expenses. So we will continue to have the continuing expense for all the different software and pieces that we have to enable this remote work, as well as the in-office expenses in, in particular, you know, I'm envisioning the T-passes, which is a big expense will be coming back. Um, you know, it's not, it doesn't show up here, but we also have had a tremendous amount of utilization of both FMLA and FFCRA, which was the um, special COVID leave that if you remember when the, it doesn't exist anymore, but when it was put out, um, there's no mechanism to recoup those costs for public entities. And so I'm hoping that, you know, those leave expenses will not be as needed. I, I, I don't think they will in FY22, and that will help us be able to kind of carry the additional costs that we'll have of being in this. <clears throat> it will be more expensive. Okay. Thank you. And and then I'll just close out with the summary big picture numbers um, so that everybody knows those uh, which are on the summary sheet. They're also on the revenue budget sheet, which I started by saying that the revenue is way up. Um, conservative approach to the beginning of the year, a lot more work came in, a lot more revenue came in to the tune of 6.2 million, roughly speaking, uh, in the budget. And that's what you'll see in the summary sheet that this mid-year budget is up from 19.93 million to 26.12 million uh, as overall revenue coming in. Um, because all that, some of that, a good portion of that is passed through money. It will come in the door and then go out the door, but there's also a lot of work related monies that are related to that. Um, for that reason and for other reasons, uh, 15.5 million is, is being deferred to future fiscal years. And that's actually a very good thing. First of all, we need the staff on board to be able to do that work. But more importantly, it sets us up well for FY22, which always had a whole series of question marks next to it as work uh, project monies that are already uh, in the door that can be set up for next year. Um, and the final comment I'll say is that Rebecca and Mark are working very hard on staffing up. Uh, we left a, a lot of positions unfilled. Those are in the process of being filled. And then there are questions with additional work, um, how much additional staff is needed. That concludes the mid-year budget review. As I say, the finance committee met uh, with a, a vote to recommend this to the executive committee um, to for its approval. And um, we actually have a motion, which I'm looking for the actual wording. Um, but why don't I pause before I ask for a motion to approve this budget? If I, would, I would add one, one thing if I could. Uh, Sam and Rebecca may have more to say about this. We, um, we are going to add four positions at this point in time. We know where three of them will be. We're discussing where the fourth will be. Uh, that is in addition to several that we've added over the course of the last few weeks, really. Um, the ones we have added are mostly refilling existing positions. The ones we will add will be mostly new positions. And that will help us to some degree with expenditures and profits, I'm mean, not profits, uh, projects um, for the remainder of this fiscal year, but honestly, mostly it's going to be helping us next year because this fiscal year, you know, is already basically four months away from ending and it takes us a while to hire people and then there's only two months left. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see the need going into the beginning of next year to hire a few more additional people. As I often say to people, I am 
I am more worried about not having enough people to do the work than I am about not having enough money to pay the people. Um, it's not always that way, but at the moment, that's how I'm feeling. Um, we see a tremendous amount of resources coming down the road from the federal government. Honestly, what, what keeps me awake at night is at the moment, and this is very different from a few months ago, is not the notion that there'll be too little money, but the notion that, you know, I wonder if we will all, including local government, have the capacity to stand up really good programs to spend the money we have. Uh, and when people have that challenge, one of the many things they do is they often turn to the regional planning agency for help, assistance, and support, and ideas, and guidance. Uh, I would note that all those unbracketed revenue items that Sam was referring to are overwhelmingly projects and pass-through. They are not unencumbered operating expenses for the agency. And one of the ways in which COVID has um, changed the way things work at MAPC is endless calls and requests for support in that sort of unrestricted operating side. You know, having three more open space plans and three more corridor plans and two more procurements don't give us more money to answer the phone calls that come from individual cities and towns regarding a COVID emergency or a legislative issue or the interpretation of a new law as Mo and I spent some time on last week or any of that stuff. And that actually sets us up for the next topic on the agenda, which is the increase in the assessment revenue. It's very good to have the projects and it's important work, but it is, it is project work and it's you know consulting work and people should remember that's different from our kind of mainstay operating requirements that are one of, that are probably the main reason we're in existence. Thank you. You're, yeah, no, sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, hearing no other questions, I would entertain a motion, and this is the wording of the motion, I'll read it out, um, to approve the FY 2021 mid-year budget adjustment as presented and to recommend that this budget be presented to the Winter Council meeting for approval on Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. I would entertain that motion. I make the motion. Second. second. <laughs> motion by John, and I didn't catch the second. I'll yield so, the sorry. second to the other person. <laughs> okay, I said second too. <laughs> Jen, Jenny. You okay. owe me a second, Jenny. Uh, I so might know motion. with the amendment from Sharonda, does not have to be part of the memo. I mean, the motion, but just we will we will spell your program correctly, Sharonda. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, any discussion on the motion? Okay, so roll call. I'm going to hand it back to Aaron for the roll call on that. Thank you. All. <laughs> thanks. Gee, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Sam. Um, okay, roll call. Uh, motion was made by John DePriest and second was made by Jenny. So here we go. Roll call. Um, everyone on mute, please. Uh, Sharonda Almeida? Aye. John Barrows? Keith Bergman? Aye. Karen Canfield? Aye, and thank you for all the work. Adam Chapdelaine? Aye. Bob Cohen? Yes. Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda Greaves? Aye. Sandra Hackman? Aye. Mo Handel? Aye. Jared Johnson? Tabor Keeley? Aye. Steve Olenoff? Aye. Caitlin Passafaro? Aye. Uh, George Proegas? Aye. Courtney Rainey? Aye. Jenny Raitt? Aye. Bandana Rao? Aye. Sam Seidel? Aye. Steve Silvera? Um, Lauren Shirtleft? Aye. Sorry. Uh, Mayor Spicer? Juan Vega? Aye. Elaine Vanya, Aaron Wartman, aye. And with that, the motion passes. Thank you so much to Sam and to the Finance Committee for that preparation. I know you have more. I yep. just want to okay. thank you uh, while we're here. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, uh, so yes, and I'll, I'm going to share Aaron's thank you to the Finance Committee uh, once again, and also to Sheila once again. Uh, the final item uh, for the Treasurer uh, today is just the uh, annual assessment 
Um, it includes the two point two and a half percent increase, and you have the numbers in front of you. I won't really comment more than what Mark just commented that this is these are flexible dollars, uh, and that the finance committee voted to uh, recommend them on to the executive committee um, as per before. Uh, if there's any discussion or questions about that before I ask for a motion. Uh, hearing none, I would entertain a motion uh, to, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this without the writing, but I assume it's similar to the prior one, um, that we approve the FY 2022 uh, ass assessment, local assessment as presented and to recommend uh, this be presented to the winter council meeting for approval on Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. I would entertain that motion. So moved. Second. Okay. That was Mo handle on the motion. Moved by Mo and second by, sorry. David. John DePriest. John DePriest, thank you. And then I'll hand this back to you, Aaron. I see I see some questions though before- Oh yeah, sorry, uh, sorry. Dis discussion on the discussion on the motion. So um, Sandra? So these assessments go up by two and a half percent a year. Is that the way it works? Adjusted by population, yes. Thank you. And Bob. So Sam, I know in the past we've talked about um, some potentially getting additional funding for this, um, and you know, politically it hasn't happened recently. Yeah. Is that something that's still being explored? Well, it, it did Mark, happen. Mark's the right one to talk to this. Okay. I, 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 my understanding is we did it once and, and that was a good time, but I, I think that two and a half percent is the annual increase. Mark, you might want to add to that. Wasn't that yeah, we did. Ago, Mark? I'm sorry? Wasn't that a several years ago we did the adjustment? Well, it, it, it was. I think it was about four years ago, maybe five. Um, at that time, uh, we had an increase in the base. We did not touch the two and a half percent increase, but we raised the base and continued with the two and a half percent. You know, I feel like there might be another point in the future when we want to do that again. Um, I, I don't know how Rebecca feels about it. I feel it's a little too soon at this moment, and especially in the midst of COVID, okay. to be asking for it. Um, I think we have a very strong relationship with the Senate president. We have a good relationship with the speaker, but I might like to have a stronger relationship with the speaker since he's new before I go in and ask for this, since obviously the leadership plays a big role in, in determining whether or not little bills of this kind get through. And, um, and it just feels a little too close to me. I think the time might come, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's quite yet. In the meantime, we continue to push for unrestricted revenue or flexible revenue from foundations and other sources to the best of our ability. Uh, and that I, I feel is where, where we are. I think next time, if we do it, I might like to try and do it in concert with a few other members of MARPA. Uh, really, uh, the sort of cherry sheet assessment only exists for MAPC and OCPC just to our south. Everyone else, if they have assessments at all, they're voluntary annually voted assessments up to the discretion of each individual member. Uh, and, you know, it, it would be better if we went at this not only with MAPC communities, but with a few other regions, if they have the appetite. So I would say maybe in another two years or so, we would consider that. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you. And I'm hearing no other questions or discussion unless I'm missing it. Aaron, I'll hand this back to you for a roll call. Okay, and thank great. you, thank you all for your time on this. On these yes, matters. I want to thank everyone as well. I um, typed in the chat. I echo Mark, but I only sent it to Sasha, so I'll say to, it to everyone right now. Uh, so with that, uh, roll call is required. Um, so please unmute, and here we go. Sharonda, aye. John Barrows, Keith, aye. Karen, aye. Adam, aye. Bob Cohen? Yes. Mayor Cartatone. Tom Daniel? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda? Aye. Sandra? Aye. Mo? Aye. Jared? Tabor? S Steve Olinoff? Aye. Caitlin? Aye. George? Aye. Courtney? Courtney. Jenny? 
Aye. Vandana? Aye. Sam? Aye. Steve Silvera? Lauren Shirtla? Yes. Mayor Spicer? Juan? Aye. Elaine? And Aaron? Aye. So uh, with that, the motion passes. Thank you so much all. And thank you again to Sam, the Finance Committee, the Finance Department and MAPC and every you know, individual director, manager for developing and vetting the mid-year budget. I, I know what a uh, undertaking it is to do a budget once, let alone twice a year. Uh, so I appreciate it as I'm sure everyone else here does as well. And with that, we are moving on to the next agenda item, which is the report of the executive director. I am mindful of the time, and I know we're running a little late, um, yes, but Mark, is. take it away. And I will try and be, uh, be quick about this. Can you folks hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Sorry. So you have the executive director's report before you. It covers two months, mid-December to mid-February. I'll note a couple of items in arts and culture to begin with. We're very pleased with the response we've received to uh, the call for the mini grant call for artists uh, in relation to, uh, to try and inspire both COVID safe behaviors and vaccination. Uh, we've had uh, really incredible response on that. And uh, we have additional efforts underway. We hope that we will be able to make awards next week. Uh, it is part of a much broader effort uh, on the part of the organization that involves arts and culture municipal collaboration and um, public health, in which Rebecca is really spearheading around the issue of COVID safe communication and addressing issues of vaccine hesitancy through improved uh, communication efforts in our region, particularly in, in regions that have been hard hit by the, uh, by the pandemic. I would invite you all to participate in one or both of the events scheduled for the release of Quincy from a Distance, which is part of our Regional Immigrant Entrepreneur Storytelling Project. Uh, you can see more information about it in the, um, in the, uh, in the report, and it's going to be a, a lovely presentation. I would urge you all to uh, participate uh, on the 3rd of March if you need a, uh, a chaser to the, uh, to the counter, to the council meeting. Um, I would note that uh, as, as many of you know, and some people have been involved. Uh, the state releases clean energy and climate plan uh, about a month ago. Uh, there are some wonderful things in that climate plan. There are also some things that we feel could be approved, improved. We are working on very, very detailed comments and suggestions that will be due and hopefully delivered well before the 22nd of March. Uh, and uh, those issues are spoken of a little more, um, a more, a little bit more specifically in the uh, in the report on page two and three. Um, scrolling down to data services, I want to congratulate uh, the team on several things. First of all, uh, the release of Connor Gately's work on the impact of land use on vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. If you haven't read that report, I urge you to read at least the executive summary. Uh, very closely related to uh, our efforts to uh, demonstrate the impact of land use and smart growth development practices on reducing vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions from a climate perspective. Really great path breaking work. Uh, I wanna congratulate Connor particularly for his efforts in that regard. I also wanna congratulate folks for an item that, that data services didn't report on here, but they'll report on next time, which is we had a wonderful uh, release yesterday. Uh, I think there were about 150 people present for the release of our report on uh, submarket typologies in the housing arena and uh, really help us to be much more specific and help our communities to be much more specific in trying to figure out what the nature of the market is in different places. It's not all the same and how to target that with policies. Great work that um, Saliki Flinge when he was here, Jesse Partridge, several other members of the staff contributed to and which was um, released yesterday. Congratulations to the entire data services team on that. Um, on page six, uh, I'll note that uh, I think last time we, we celebrated the release of our ACR, Accelerating Climate Resiliency Grants, uh, in the second round. Uh, that was uh, featured in a Globe article, actually. And now we're already on to the third round. So please uh, encourage applications in that round. ACR is one of our, our great new programs dealing with climate adaptation. 
that is funded by the Barr Foundation. I'm not going to touch on legislative priorities because we're going to spend some time on that when we go forward uh, in the remainder of the meeting. I'm going to congratulate Carlos Montanez, particularly one of our principal planners for the complete, completion of really two master plans, a master plan in Rockland and a visioning plan, not quite yet a master plan, but leading up to a master plan in the town of Winthrop. Neither one is a super easy project. Uh, you know, both required a lot of work with um, different constituency groups in both of those communities, uh, but they are communities with which we have good close relationships. And uh, I don't know if Jen is on the phone, Jen Constable, but I, I think she probably is, She's certainly familiar with the Rockland work. And, um, and Winthrop is also a community we've worked very closely with over the years. So seeing them take this sort of next step of doing a vision for the future or doing a master plan was really great. And uh, I, you know, Carlos in, in typical um, fashion for Carlos, for those of you who know them, know him, he, he reported on this with about two sentences on each one saying that he had finished these projects. And I told him he had to, he had to make it longer and tell us some of the substance of these projects because they represent great works. And, uh, and that additional information is presented in the executive director's report. We're continuing to work on additional master plans. Master plan in Saugus is one that's underway right now. That is a challenging project, but uh, we're all working to try and make sure that it's a successful one. Um, I wanna note on page, um, let's see, it's page, I don't know why all these pages have the letter D in front of them, but D13, North Suffolk, Public Health Collaborative COVID Vaccine Clinics is part of many ongoing efforts on the part of the uh, organization. Rebecca, Barry, Lizzie, Mark, their staff to help communities to figure out ways to utilize the state's vaccine system, which is opaque and difficult to utilize, to be perfectly frank. I think people know that. And to set up additional clinics and efforts to serve particularly hard hit communities and folks that may have difficulty acquiring the vaccine. Uh, as I often say, it's one thing if you have flexible time and a car to get to one of the mass vax clinics. It's another thing if you're a single mother of two kids with two jobs, it's very challenging. And uh, the, the work on the North Suffolk Public Health Collaborative COVID vaccine clinics, other segments of the executive director's report highlight other activities are all related to the very intense work going on at MAPC now regarding, um, regarding the vaccination process, particularly in hard hit communities and among vulnerable populations. I wanna really stand that up and, and note the importance of it. Can I ask if Eric Hove is of, uh, on, the, on the call? I don't think he is, but I will note that there is an update on Metro Common that is presented. Uh, we're really moving quickly into the phase of vetting policy recommendations as we still have the end of June as our targeted time to complete Metro Common 2050. Uh, on page 15, under community engagement, you'll see a reference to the Delia Agricultural Property in Franklin, where we are trying to help the town of Franklin to figure out the reuse of, this, um, uh, of this, uh, these parcels along the Charles River. And they may be interested in attain, obtaining some of these parcels as well. Uh, they're currently agricultural and they are adjacent to other town owned parcels. The reason I bring this to your attention is take some time to click on the word here, uh, not right now, but you will be given a, um, a, a, an amazing view and tour of this really beautiful site. Uh, and it will be presented to you uh, uh, via the, uh, the courtesy of the MAPC drone. Uh, it's really quite, Quite amazing. Our community engagement team, Alex Koppelman, I don't know if he worked on this one, but I suspect he did. And others of the agency are getting very good at presenting this sort of bird's eye view for property reviews, which is a particularly good technique to use during COVID and is really worth a look. I'm very proud of, proud of that little project, honestly. We're getting close to the end of the report now, a little more under public health on COVID, on COVID coordination that I won't go through any further. You can see under public health really, most of it relates to COVID issues. Uh, we've expanded Blue Bikes to Salem. We're very excited about that, Tom. Uh, and we are still working on a few other communities in that vicinity to see if we can make it a little bit more of a regional block project in that, um, 
in that area. But we're excited about the, the move to, uh, to Salem. And we will talk about the, um, uh, the mass development grants for taxi and delivery later on during this meeting. I think that concludes my presentation, except to say that we have two wonderful new staff people, uh, Jessica Belanger in transportation and Sukanya Sharma uh, in uh, land use. Uh, Sukanya, I believe, is here at the moment. Is that correct? Are you here, Sukanya? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks there she is. Sukanya joins us uh, most recently from the Champaign Regional Planning Commission in central Illinois. She is still there. But uh, when we go back to the office eventually, someday we will greet her in Boston in person. I can't wait for that since I've only met her online. But we are very excited to have you here with us, Sukanya. Welcome to MAPC. Thank you, everyone. And I'm done, Erin. Thank you. Any questions, if people have? Not seeing any. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that I was really impressed with the work that you guys did with teen empowerment around a Shannon grant stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to note that. And I think that's a great partnership and um, very timely in response to what was happening last spring and so forth. So. Yeah. Thank you. It was it was not. Thank you, Sharonda. It was not one of the items I highlighted, but there is a fairly robust description. Uh, I believe it's either under community engagement or municipal collaboration. I can't remember which one, but but it is in there. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Sharonda, for that um, note as well. Um, okay, seeing no other um, kind of questions or comments, uh, next up in the agenda is uh, the report of the Legislative Committee, and I'm going to call in Keith who is the legis Legislative Committee Chair, uh, to take it away. Very good. Uh, thanks very much, Erin. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, the Legislative uh, Committee uh, had a meeting on uh, February 10th uh, where we reviewed uh, the document that you uh, have uh, for uh, today's uh, meeting on an, uh, priorities for an equitable economic recovery. Uh, and that uh, passed uh, unanimous, unanimously uh, with uh, uh, recommendation uh, to the executive committee. And is, uh, is Lizzie on the call uh, I, to, uh, for me to hand this off to? Yeah, hi Keith. Thank all you. right, thank you so much for all the, you know, I, every, every month I, I have to just uh, say what a great job our government affairs team is doing. Uh, largely because uh, uh, it, it's, su it's such a great group, but also because they've been so busy thanks to the legislature. Uh, so um, a, a lot of work has been done and is, we're continuing to do, and we're just ver very proud and, uh, of all, all that our staff is doing for us and the, and the leadership uh, that uh, Mark and Rebecca and, and Lizzie and her team offer. So thanks. Thank you, Keith. Um, so what we are going to be going over today is this document um, that Mark sent out very late last night because uh, it will not surprise you, we were working on it until the very last minute, um, that outlines what we are thinking about in terms of our priorities around recovery. Um, and you know, we didn't bring this document in advance of the bill filing deadline for the legislative session, um, because these are things that we anticipate that we will have an opportunity to raise as the legislative session moves forward. And that's particularly true um, in light of potential federal recovery dollars that might come down. Um, I, I'm not, I, I'm kind of like looking to Mark and Rebecca because I'm not entirely sure how they want me to go through this document because it is four pages long. Um, I'm happy to kind of give an overview and kind of walk us through it. Um, yeah, just give an overview of the main sections. Great. I'm happy to do that. I think that might be the easiest thing. And I'm also happy to share my screen provided I have the privileges to do that. I'm just looking for a thumbs up from Sasha. Yes, great. All right. I think that might actually be easier to kind of walk us through that. Excellent. All right. It should be up. I'm going to make it a little bigger because I got older during COVID too. Um, all right. So 
starting at the top, um, you'll notice that, and we've talked about this around the table a little bit before, that we really wanted to, um, and this was a decision made within the government affairs team, you know, at the legislative committee um, and in conversations with all of you, that we want to make sure that we are centering equity inside our priorities around um, recovery. And then recently, actually, through conversations um, with a lot of folks at MEPC who helped put this document together, um, we ended up adding the word resiliency in there because I think that also, um, it, it has a lot of different meanings that we want to make sure we're incorporating into our recovery priorities. Um, so starting at the top, our first priorities are around workforce development and small business support. Um, and what we have here are a number of ways that we feel like we can provide um, policy recommendations around workforce development and small business support. And then we have a number of priorities in the end that would be around highlighting funding and technical assistance directly um, to entities that would help promote this. Um, so the first recommendation, um, it's a bit of a wonky one, but it is to help change um, the mass hire workforce boards in order to do um, a more holistic job, I think that's the way I would describe it, of their regional blueprint planning documents. Um, and in particular, the things that we would recommend here would be to make sure that the workforce boards uh, can better reflect our current demographic and economic conditions. And then think about ways that the communities could be grouped together to take advantage of federal dollars that might come down. So bringing together like communities to be able to take advantage of federal dollars. The next recommendation in this section is around, as a conversation a lot of people are having, um, around the promotion of vacant commercial spaces. Um, and I think this is kind of in direct response to the fact this question, ongoing question that I expect will be an ongoing question for kind of the, the next 10 years or so of the changing nature of work. Um, but thinking about opportunities to redevelop commercial spaces. And then um, particularly this whole next paragraph um, is really about making sure that we're doing that in a climate smart manner. Um, and again, just a, a special thank you to Cami um, to, for her input in this section um, and working with Betsy to really be thinking about how we can, if we have an opportunity to do uh, redevelopment or retrofits, that we sh this is the time to actually make those investments in a climate smart way. The next recommendation is around the governor's workforce skills cabinet. So that um, cabinet currently includes a secretariat from labor, education, and housing and economic development. And we would propose expanding that cabinet to include additional secretariats of um, health and human services, environment, and transportation. And you know, again, I think we had some internal conversations about the utility of expanding a cabinet, sort of an oversight body. Are they really going to get there um, to kind of make the recommendations that we want? But we feel like this is a step that we could take that would give us that more holistic approach that we're looking for. Um, and then as promised, the this next section is really around funding and technical assistance support. Um, and we have sort of three buckets of funding that we think would be helpful. So the first is really to expand um, the Mass Office of Business Development pilot program. Um, that program exists right now and um, it is set to expire in June of 21. And we think that it would be a useful program to continue. Um, the second bucket here is around additional uh, sustained and continued technical assistance for small businesses. Um, and particularly making sure that we're investing significant resources in minority and women-owned businesses. And then this last idea is around um, making sure um, that small businesses can transition to employee stock ownership models. Um, and this is really based on the idea, and we do uh, link in the document to some research that um, shows that when um, employees actually have a partnership or a stock ownership inside a small business, it, it actually creates more resiliency inside that entity. And so we would want to make sure that the Mass Growth Capital Corporation actually provides incentives um, to allow more support for cooperatives and ASOPs. 
I'm going to um, keep going because I think if that's all right with Aaron, um, just to keep going through the whole document, I'm getting a nod, um, and then happy to take questions and kind of drill down on pieces later at the end. So the next broad section is really around, um, again, kind of better integrating our climate, housing, and transportation priorities all together. Um, and I should just pause here and note that um, the document is uh, also pretty akin to some of the things people have seen or will see inside our Metro Common Policy recommendations. And that integrated approach, um, rather than a, a siloed approach to our work, is something that we're striving for inside Metro Common. And so you kind of see it here. It's sort of like a preview here in our recovery priorities. Um, so the first one will not be a surprise. Um, this is really about accelerating um, decarbonization inside the building sector and inside the transportation sector. Um, and so we highlight this section right here, um, highlights a number of mandates that we would suggest. And then this section here highlights a number of incentives that we would suggest for consideration. This next idea is one very close to my heart is the idea of creating a climate infrastructure bank. Um, this is not a totally brand new idea, but we definitely feel like a moment of recovery is the right time for it. Um, so this would essentially create um, a funding and, and debt service program to make sure that we're um, able to invest in um, decarbonization and resilience efforts um, uh, and big projects, infrastructure projects, using um, a green or climate infrastructure bank. Um, and again, you know, this next one, it's not a surprising um, piece here, but we're specifically calling out funding for public transit. Um, if folks will remember, MAPC was really involved in the federal ARA program. Um, we did a lot with our ARA dollars, but we would love to be able to make sure that we could be more transformative with any federal infrastructure uh, transportation dollars that might come down. We, we do think that we will see those under um, a Biden administration. Um, and we want to specifically call out uh, funding for planning because that was one of the biggest challenges with ARA dollars uh, where there, was, there wasn't significant funding for, for planning and design. The next recommendation is um, really around uh, housing production um, and addressing, um, making sure that we're meeting our housing production goals um, and addressing displacement concerns. Um, and this is, again, it's kind of a straightforward expansion of our typical investment in housing production piece. Um, we note here that the housing choices legislation which passed inside the economic development bill, um, we have some thoughts about um, how that program itself could be implemented. These are some things that we think could be included. Uh, and again, the next recommendation, not unlike the first block of recommendations, is really around increasing funding specifically for um, individuals who are, you know, really deeply impacted financially by the public health crisis. Um, and then the one piece that I would call in here that, that we talk about um, is the utility bill assistance is one of our recommendations. So then the final section of the document is really kind of looking about um, Sort of the changing nature that the uh, that the pandemic kind of presented all of us with. So we have two recommendations here around digitizing municipal government, um, and I just I should just pause and note that the um, overcoming the di digital divide category really came up in our legislative committee meeting. We've been doing a lot of work at this at the agency. Um, my colleagues, Josh Eichen, Matt Zagaya, and Ryan Kelly, when I asked uh, them to give me, you know, a paragraph of recommendations that we would include here, they gave me a page and a half of six different recommendations that we distilled down into this one. Um, so there's a lot of work that we can do here, but I think this um, highlights this overcoming the digital divide. Sure highlights the fact that um, a lot of people think of the digital divide issue in the Commonwealth as a rural versus urban issue. It is not. A lot of our um, urban communities also really struggle with connectivity issues. Um, and so we have a number of recommendations about how we would address that and try to overcome that. Um, and then this last, very last recommendation, kind of near and dear to all of us, is the fact that um, 
we have seen an uptick in the number of individuals and residents in our communities who are more connected to municipal work. And um, we want to make sure that we allow that to continue. So we have recommendations around enabling um, continued virtual participation um, and making sure that more people have creative ways to access their municipal government. Um, so I think that was as fast as I could go through an overview of all the pieces in here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because it's less awkward to actually look at you instead of the document. <laughs> but I'm happy to take questions. And I am just going to note that where this stands in a longer term process, we, you folks have already approved uh, a series of uh, direct legislative bill priorities. Um, there was also a document that didn't need approval on ongoing legislative priorities. Then there is the third piece, which is today's piece specifically on recovery. You'll notice that many of these items are legislative, but a number of them are regulatory or, or programmatic as well. They're not entirely legislative. And then next month, I hope, if not next month by April, we will have a document on revenue issues. And that will, that will then constitute the overview of our objectives for the two-year legislative session. And I think the only other thing I'd note is, you know, we are as a team having conversations with legislators about, um, in general, our legislative priorities to, to seek co-sponsorships. Co um, but in our conversations with legislators, they can say they're very eager for kind of a list of ideas of where they should be looking at to, to think about recovery. I think there's a lot of appetite in the building for, for pieces like this, ideas like this about where they can turn. Great, great. And Mark, thank you for, and obviously Lizzie and the legislative group and team, thanks for a really comprehensive kind of look at that. And then Mark, thank you for those kind of like benchmark timeline expectations. Um, Sandra, did you still have a question or? And thanks, I was just gonna ask for a little bit more on how we would be using this document, but I think Mark, you addressed that. So. Um, it looks great. It's just uh, it's, it's 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 just chock full of, of ideas. So I imagine we'll be working with legislators and the administration. And I just I wasn't sure if we should try to pass some of this along to municipal governments as well. But um, anyway, the, well, you you can pass anything you want on to municipal governments. That's always yeah. fine. I mean, it's a public yeah. document, and it's it's hopefully going to be passed here. But it, it is yeah. honestly a little bit more for internally organizing yeah. our priorities. It's not mm -hmm. really seen as a, as a public facing document. Mm -hmm. um, those will probably be much more focused on the narrower, more specific issues yeah. sort of in bite-sized chunks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's a lot for, for people to digest. So I, I, I appreciate the comprehensiveness and the depth and it's really looks great, thank you. Thank you, Sandra and Karen. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, exactly. There's so much information here. You wrapped your arms around a lot. So kudos on that. Uh, just two things I wanted to just point out. The I think the very last um, paragraph regarding you know taking lessons learned to improve engagement with them um, with residents is so there's so much potential there. And I I think Lizzie, you're absolutely right that at the state house people are like, all right you know, let's, let's not drop the ball on this, but you know, how do we do this? So that I think is a huge one that is, is very actionable. Um, the rest of it, honestly, it's going to take some time to digest um, because there's a lot of, of really good thoughts in there. And um, I, I, I'm not prepared with all of the questions I, that, you know, started popping up as I was reviewing it, but I need some more time on that for sure. But thank you. It's a great, great synthesis. Great, and Buzz? Um, yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, I too want to, uh, want to compliment the, the comprehensive nature of it um, and, and particularly both picking up the transparency and the equity issues uh, at the same time that you really balance, I think you balance quite well uh, the issues of regulatory versus incentive uh, programs. Um, I really speak this morning primarily to announce my continuing and promise the continuing to lean into the idea uh, that act, the action on climate change is so crucial over the next several years that things that the state does in economic development really ought to have a priority uh, on, on things that are climate, uh, climate appropriate 
and actually negate things that are not climate appropriate. And I think this, this has done a great job of, you've done a great job of including this in that, but I think we, uh, all the complex stuff that MAPC does, uh, climate needs to be right up there on the top, on the top version, at least until 2035, by which time we'll be 100%, uh, we will have beaten the 2050 uh, guidelines. So thanks. Great, thanks, Buzz. Uh, Steve Olinoff. Yes, um, this has gone a lot better from the last time I read it. It's still very techy and, and difficult to read uh, and, and some of the terminology. And if you don't know what it is, it's, it's really hard to follow. I mean, for example, digitized municipal government, I mean, that means something to you. It may not mean something to everybody. You're talking about better electronic uh, communication and uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's getting better, but it's, it's still just a little bit, still a little bit too techy. Okay. I appreciate that. I, <laughs> it's, we're, we tend to be kind of wonky. I think the one thing to keep in mind, I think actually it's kind of to some of the, um, some of the points that were made earlier is that, you know, we tend to use these documents. They, these documents themselves are not our marketing materials. This isn't what we would kind of put out to the public and not even necessarily what we would put out um, to the whole state house, but certainly there are, um, there are a lot of wonks inside the building who actually like love this stuff. Um, and so for those that want that information, we make sure to get it to them. And then uh, when we think about actually putting it out to the public, I think we, we do tend to work with our unbelievable communications team um, to make sure that it's a little, a little de-wonked and a little more digestible. So I definitely appreciate that. I'm very sensitive to it. Great, thank you. Any other comment, Jenny? I'm, I'm a wonky kind of person and I really liked it. Um, so it's like, oh, and I like that and that one and that one. Um, but I, I did have a question, um, which is what about something related to the health equity task force or anything related to sort of public health agencies and their relationship with the state health and human services and just emergency preparedness and planning and response. I feel like that piece, there could just be some something about that, but I wonder if you already thought about that and sort of put it somewhere else. Yeah, Rebecca, do you want to take this on? Because she actually mentioned this to me at LegCom and I think it's on me that I didn't add it in. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree, Jenny, and I think we could add a, a paragraph here. I mean, I think at the, at the same time, we are already thinking and, and trying to start a conversation really kind of looking at the past year and, you know, it, it's what we've already known, but really thinking about what should the future public health or kind of more broadly health look like. And so I, I see that as maybe, I think an important point to add, and I, I would be open to that amendment, but also just kind of another major effort that I hope the agency will be really playing a leading role in over the next year. And, you know, on that point, I will say um, that we were successful in getting $10 million in this year's budget um, and hopefully $10 million in next year's budget that is available um, for communities that want to come together for public health collaborations. And that is the notice of uh, intent is out for communities that are interested and we are already trying to gather our communities together to really think about how do we expand public health functions and help communities work together. So I think there's a tremendous amount of work to be done in that space. Any other feedback comments? I do want to. I do want to move us along because we have staff waiting for an important presentation. So. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Legislative Committee. We do not. My understanding is we don't need to have a vote at this time, or do we need a vote? What is the will? I think yes. we like one. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we are happy to do that. Um, so uh, maybe Keith, maybe you could say what um, kind of motion you're looking for, or maybe you can make the motion yourself. Happy to do that. Uh, I would move that the executive committee adopt the, um, let me call it up here, the uh, uh, priorities for an equitable and resilient economic recovery document as uh, 
uh, recommended by the legislative committee and uh, presented by staff. So I'll move. Second. Uh, okay. Um, we're going to do the motion by Keith and the second by Sandra, if that's okay with everyone, just to make it a little cleaner. Uh, thank you both for that. And thank you for my third over there. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Great. Uh, roll call vote is going to be required. So if everyone could get off mute, I know some people have dropped off, uh, but if I go through your name and you didn't get to say I, um, or abstention or whatever your vote is, just put it in the chat. Okay. Here we go. Sharonda? Aye. John? Aye. <laughs> it's okay. Keith Bergman? Aye. Karen Canfield? Aye. Adam Chapdelaine? Aye. Bob Cohen? Yes. Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda? Aye. Sandra? Aye. Mo? Aye. Jared? Aye. Tabor, Steve Olinoff. Aye. Caitlin. I think I had to leave. Uh, George. Aye. Courtney. Abstain. Jenny. Aye. Bandana. Abstain. Sam. Aye. Steve. Lauren. Mayor Spicer. Juan. Abstain. Elaine. And Aaron in favor. So uh, motion passes with three abstentions. I think those abstentions were Juan, uh, Vandana, and Courtney. Am I correct on those, everyone? I think so. Um, so the motion passes. Thank you so much again, uh, legislative committee, legislative team. Like, what a great comprehensive document. And I don't think we've ever used the term wonk so much in a meeting, but as a fellow wonk, I loved it. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Great, thank you so much. Um, so next up on the agenda is the project update. And I understand we are uh, going, moving along uh, in a transportation kind of way. Um, Travis, Mar I just, Hi, Travis. I'll just, I'll just tee this up while Travis and Mara, I think get on the screen. Uh, as you all know, uh, we did a tremendous project uh, in alliance with Mass Development to try and respond to some of the urgent COVID needs uh, in the transportation arena, and that has now been expanded to a more general program, and those funds are going out as well. Uh, and I wanted to call upon uh, the transportation staff to make a presentation to you about this really important project that uh, I am very, very proud of. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'll, I'll present. I know we're, we're short on time, and um, so can everyone see my screen? Thumbs up? Okay. Um, so... Real briefly, we'll go over the program, both programs urgent and, and uh, as well as the new program. So just to let everyone know, the, in case for those that don't know, the origins of this program are the legislation in 2016 that established uh, uh, regulating the TNCs and there's the 20 cent fee and five cents of that fee goes to what is called the Transportation Infrastructure Enhancement Fund that uh, is overseen by mass development to support the taxi industry. And, the purpose of the program is to provide financial support and to help the taxi industry as it transitions from a world where Uber and Lyft is now part of the rideshare uh, marketplace. And uh, so in 2018, for those who don't know, we were at MAPC contracted by Mass Development to look at how best to use those funds. Part of that recommendation was to develop two programs. One we call the one third is the taxi partnership program that MAPC oversees and two thirds is a taxi business support program, program that mass development uh, oversees. And so the purpose of the partnership program or what we call the taxi partnership grant program is to support the taxi industry by developing new partnerships with public agencies and, and others for uh, new public transportation, non-emergency medical and deliveries uh, to help fill the gaps where there are gaps in a, maybe in our public transportation network across the Commonwealth. And MAPC is administering this program via an agreement with mass development. So while, the pro while we were developing this and setting up the program, uh, of course, at the end of 2019, early 2020, COVID uh, pandemic hit and the decision was made to accelerate it. So what we've, uh, working with mass development, we decided to create what we call the urgent program um, for those that don't know. And so the eligible entities were state and local agencies, RTAs, as well as health and human service providers. Initially, we sent up 
uh, half a million dollars of math development of the funds to um, to to do the program. And then uh, as we came in with the grants, we realized there was a great need more than the five hundred thousand. And so uh, ultimately became uh, we worked math development and became a million dollar budget to do the urgent program. And ultimately, we had twenty five grantees that were selected to do them. And here are the uh, eligible populations under the urgent program. As you can see, we worked to try to find those that were most uh, vulnerable and impacted by COVID. Uh, so persons experiencing homelessness, people who are homebound, older adults and essential workers, veterans. And then we listed the area on the right as the eligible trip. So things like food delivery, um, getting people food, prescription drugs, um, as well as other transportation needs. So I know we're, I'm going through this very quickly because I know we're running out of time, but um, under the urgent program, this was the geographic reach uh, of the people who helped, who got, or some of the geographic uh, reach of the um, agencies that got the urgent grant. And so one thing I wanna point out is that this was a statewide program, even though it was administered by MATC. So we worked with our partners at other state agencies, as well as regional planning agencies to get the word out statewide. And so some of the, the clusters you see there are the RTAs that um, got some of the grants like in Metro West, as in CADA, as well as Pioneer Valley. So very quickly, this is what we've um, so far as of the end of 2020, a lot of the funds came through in the spring and then the summer through some of them people didn't really get their program started till October, November. But we've had about 13,000 trips, about 7,000 individuals served with the program so far working where those agencies are working with about 40 different transportation companies across the Commonwealth. And so the biggest thing that we're seeing is, is the non-emergency medical trips. We have a lot of um, RTAs and councils on aging that suspended either volunteer drivers or they are no longer taking a lot of people in vans. They're taking people one, just one person in a van. And so those uh, are needed as well as the food deliveries for people that are now experiencing, they no longer you know, have work, as well as transportation needs of the homeless which uh, most of that is with the Boston Public Health Commission. So every two months we are uh, requiring people to report what, with their data well, that you saw there in the graph earlier, and as well as how's it going, and we ask them questions. Most are extremely satisfied with the program. They think it's very important. It fills the gaps with, the, with their um, transportation system. And I put a couple quotes here of some of the things we ask people on their surveys, like they're very appreciative of it. It's, it's been a, a big help in filling those gaps when they can't take the vans out or when there's been suspension of public transit in their region. And the taxi companies we're hearing, they're very thankful too to have this business that otherwise they would not have. And it's been a lifeline for them. So um, just a few lessons here, but really that basically it takes a while to get the program going, but marketing and everything is, is really critical. Getting the data and the communication has been a great help working with mass development. I want to point out, um, if I haven't done so, my colleague Mara Holland has been a, a great resource. She and I are a tag team on this. We communicate with our grantees quite a bit on sharing what works. And as we know, this program has been a lifeline for those that have it. So the next program, that, while the urgent program was winding down and continuing, we were developing the next program that the awards are just going out. Same um, group of, uh, same group of, of, of uh, trips. The funding is larger now, instead of a million, it's 2.5 million. The eligible entities are the same. We did open it up to nonprofits, that's the one change. And we did take away, in terms of the trip types, um, what was done when we didn't have the categories. We asked people, tell us what you think the needs are. And we encourage you to, of course, prioritize vulnerable populations um, that are due to COVID. So we received 57 applications with almost five, over 5.8 million in requests, double the amount of money we have. The map you're seeing here is we wanted to map out what was the geographic reach of the people who applied. Uh, some, we got quite a few applications from like nonprofits and transit agencies that covered a large geography. So you can see we got responses from across the state, including areas we didn't see with the urgent program, such as the middle part of the state and down on the Cape and south of like New Bedford and those areas. We have um, worked with mass development and we are going to fund 47 uh, new programs. I hope the press release will go out soon for mass development. You'll see that. Um, and those are the new programs that'll be going out this year. And the funds are to use those uh, taxi partnerships through the end of the year. So what's next is, like I mentioned, we're winding down the urgent grants. We're starting up the new partnership grants. We are going to survey the taxi partners. 
we surveyed them early on to get their read as to how things were going early on the urgent program. We want to get their read, is this program, how is it going, how can we improve it? We are going to work with Mass Development on improving on the program. We have some ideas on project delivery, both on the MAPC side as well as locally with the uh, grant recipient. And then we are planning for another round of grant funding in the fall of 2021. And I put the link here of the taxi partnerships um, in terms of that's where we keep things up to date for the public. And we list the partners and the people, including contact information where people who are interested in trips where they can go. So I've given, uh, I'm going to stop my screen. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I guess you answered everything before there were questions. I uh, want to also thank Mark for his help and, and Margie Weinberger has been a, a great resource as well on this, on the legal side with the grant agreements, the contracts and working with the development to, to, to her. And Mara, and Mara Holland, who hasn't spoken in, in addition to Travis are the two people uh, most pushing this. Of course, uh, Eric Barras has also been actively engaged. Uh, some real meaningful on the ground help to real people during a, a very difficult period of time. And I thank you. They, they stood this program up from nothing. Really, eight months ago, there was absolutely nothing there. So thank you, Mark. And I agree with Jared's sentiment in the uh, chat as well. It's a really neat uh, program. And uh, Travis, would you uh, maybe share that um, slideshow with um, Heidi, so she can re-share it with the executive committee. Um, I think that I'd like to go through that slideshow again. I, I appreciate that you went through it very quickly, um, but I wanna kind of re-digest it. Um, Happy to do that. At my own pace as well. Is there any questions for Travis or Mara on this? Seeing none, I, thank you again, both of you and the transportation department and um for um this work it's very cool great all right next up on the agenda is the update on the winter council meeting so i think i'm going to call on mark so the update on the winter council meeting is that it is taking place virtually at 9 30 on the 3rd of march and we need you all there because there is actual business to do we can't transact that business without a quorum and we must adopt the budget. We must adopt the assessment increase. And so we, we need you. Uh, the business meeting will be from 9.30 to 10 o'clock, maybe 10.15, based on how long things took the, today. I think we might go to 10.15. And then we will have a fascinating program on the future of work, uh, which will be led by our data services department, which in collaboration with many other institutions and, and entities has been doing a lot of research on the future of work post COVID. Some of that work took place before COVID and some of it has taken place since. Uh, some of you may have heard that we were also planning uh, on the prospect of an event, which we originally thought would be at the Winter Council meeting on the subject of the impact of the pandemic and the recession on women in the economy, particularly, but not exclusively women of color. Uh, I am extremely committed to doing that, but it was too short notice for it to do it on the 3rd of March. So in the second half of March or sometime in April, please look for an MAPC sponsored webinar. We hope that Senator Spilko, we know Senator Spilko will be with us and we hope that Congresswoman Presley will be with us. Um, I even had some ideas this morning when I was listening to someone, something on the news about a former governor that we might invite, but we'll see if that actually happens. And, um, and some very good experts in the field. So that will be coming later, but not at the Winter Council meeting. Winter Council meeting will be focusing on the future of work. I hope to see you all there. Ditto. Uh, thank you, Mark. And if um, you could just go to the chat and um, click the link to register. Um, again, obviously we need um, uh, the council's vote on the assessment, but obviously the programming information is really, really interesting. Um, and I think there'll, there'll be great discussion and data uh, points uh, for us to further explore. So thank you for that. Um, and next up on the agenda, other business not known at the time of the posting. Mark, anything? Great. Um, so with that being said, um, 
I will be looking at this time for a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Second. Awesome. I'm going to give the motion to Mo and the second to John DePriest. Oh boy. I know, <laughs> I know uh, some people had to hop off. So if everyone could just unmute for one minute, um, we're gonna get through this as quickly as possible. So roll calls required. Sharonda. John Aye. Barry. Keith. Aye. Karen, I think had to hop off. Adam. Bob. Yes. Mayor Bye. 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 Mayor Curtitone. Uh, Tom. John DePriest. Yes. Yolanda. Aye. Sandra. Yes. Mo. Yes. Jared. And I. <laughs> Bye. Tabor. Yes. Uh, Steve Olinoff. Aye. Caitlin. George. Courtney. Jenny. Yes. Vandana. Yes. Sam. Aye. Steve. Lauren. Mayor Spicer. Juan. Elaine. And Erin. Aye. Uh, with that, the motion passes. The meeting is adjourned at 103. Uh, thank you all for coming and joining us in the conversation. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the week. And I will see you next Wednesday at, at the Winter Council meeting. Have a good one.